Okay. Hello. I am Rebecca Benson. I am currently an intern with Disability Rights South Dakota, and I'm completing my capstone project for my occupational therapy degree um, at the University of South Dakota. And so that capstone project is anything or it can be anything that you want to get more experience in. So I chose getting more experience in advocacy because I feel it's very important for occupational therapists to be able to advocate for their clients, but also the populations as a whole, um, whether it's in a community setting or at the state or federal level. So today I'm going to be speaking with you guys about uh, remediating barriers faced by individuals with disabilities. And so I sent out a survey to all of you, whether you are a community member or an individual with a disability, asking you to fill it out and to describe your, or what are yours or what are your perceptions of occupational barriers or occupational limitations. So that's daily activities. Anything you do during your day is an occupation. So I'm gonna share those comparisons from what I got from my survey results. And then I'm gonna share how to remediate some of those barriers that I looked at. So as we go through this, if you have any questions, you can ask them through the chat or just go ahead and unmute yourself and talk out loud. So we'll go ahead and get started. So when I'm talking through all of this, you're going to see a lot of individual experience versus community perception. So what I'm really comparing is what the individuals with disabilities actually experienced in their daily life based on their disability compared to what the community perceives or their thoughts and their beliefs of what individuals with disabilities experience. So looking at the disability diagnosis, I asked the individuals with disabilities to choose out of one of these categories what their disability falls into. And I realized this doesn't cover everything, but it was as broad as I could get it while also keeping it um, concise as possible. And then I asked the community to say what they thought was the most prevalent. Uh, disability or disability diagnosis. And as you can see, what was the most prevalent versus what the community thought they lined up where the mental or emotional disability is what is most prevalent followed by cognition and then mobility. So now when we go to look at our occupational limitations or our daily activity limitations on this question, people could choose as many things as they saw fit as being limitations during their day. So this affects the most individuals overall. And so for that individual experience, you see the driving or using public tra transport being the most difficult. And this makes a whole bunch of sense because if you are driving or using public transportation, you have to be able to have good mobility or, and then have cognitive and emotional um, and mental stability as you go through that and understanding everything that goes into those components. And so that really makes sense since there's so much going into it. You even have to have vision and hearing a lot of times when you are driving or using public transportation because not all places are accessible. It also makes sense that financial management and medication management were also high in um, the survey results for the individuals just because of how many people had or said that they had the mental or emotional disability or the cognitive disability. Now, when we compare it to the community's perception, you really get to see how the community thinks maintaining safety and employment is the biggest thing for individuals with disabilities, where for individuals with disabilities, they're often looking at more of the basics and things that they want now. They think they're safe and they probably are safe in their um, eyes view. And then they're also not thinking about going to employment yet because we've got to get our basics met before we start reaching out for an employment. And maybe we don't necessarily, or maybe individuals with disabilities don't necessarily think that employment's important at this time for them. And so that's why they're not putting it as a limitation. So if we move on to what is the greatest occupational limitation for individuals with disabilities or what the community perceives, this is looking at one thing. So they got to choose just one option. And so you can see how vast the limitations are for individuals with 
disabilities or even what the community perceived because you can see the percentages are very, very low and it's across the whole board. I thought it was very interesting that social and emotional health maintenance was high amongst both of the categories. And I think this is very important because we've got to be able to maintain our social and emotional health to be able to interact in public and get out there. Then when you look at the community perception, you see that the community participation as a community, we think that is very, very important to be involved. But then if you look at the individual experience, bathing is very high. So we've got to meet those basic necessities and things that what come natural to me and I don't have any difficulties with, but somebody with a disability, like they want to take a bath just as much or shower just as much as I do. And so we have to meet those before we can move into community participation as one thing to think about. Then we look at occupational barriers. So they again could choose, anybody could choose as many categories as they wanted. And I thought this was also very interesting. So when we look at this from a whole, from as many individuals being affected as possible, societal attitudes was the highest in both categories. And I thought this was great. Okay, society realizes that their attitudes towards individuals with disabilities needs to be adjusted. And individuals with disabilities also think that needs to be adjusted. For me, I'm like, why is it not happening yet? Um, but I think it's just public knowledge is not there yet. And so doing like this presentation, and others like it will increase that knowledge. I've even talked with legislators and different things that they didn't know. And I was like, you don't know this, you're a legislator. And they're like, we need to have information provided to us because we can't go look through everything every single day. And they love hearing from people and what their difficulties are. So then they do take that into account when they are voting on different things. As I was with them, I talked to them about different things from an occupational therapy standpoint, also from individuals with disabilities, since I'm with disabilities rights. And they're like, I need to think about this and this law and this law and this law that I'm voting on. So highly encouraged reaching out to them. Also, when you're looking at the occupational barriers that affect the most amount of people, you see that loud environment and unpredictable schedule. And that is high on both of them. And this is really important and it aligns with what the disability diagnosis were for the highest. These, when it's, there's a loud environment or it's an unpredictable schedule, it can become very overwhelming for an individual and even myself. I like things that are predictable and I don't have a disability. So I have even seen it in individuals that I have served that having a predictable schedule is very helpful in knowing what we want to do. And I think that's just general human nature as well. Now looking at the greatest occupational barrier or daily activity barrier. And so this, you could only pick one. Again, you can see that the percentages are so low but this, since we're now picking one, goes to show the differences between the community's perceptions versus the individual's experience. So the community, you see the perception being societal attitudes. That's the biggest thing affecting individuals with disabilities. But then you go to the individual experience and they're like, no, we need to fix some of those basic things, having a predictive, predictable schedule, um, altering the environment so it's not so overwhelming. And then also being able to get around places, whether it's steps or just not being accessible to individuals with disabilities, whether it's a wheelchair or um, cognitive or anything, an inaccessible environment can really be anything at this point. So now we're going to take a look at the barriers that I looked at. And I know there's so many more barriers out there, but I wanted to provide quite a bit, but also keep it to a manageable size. So we're gonna look at cognitive barriers, room setup, vision, sensory barriers, societal attitudes, policy and implementation, transportation barriers, and physical barriers. So to start out with, we're gonna talk about cognitive barriers. So cognitive barriers can be barriers to individuals with disabilities, but they can also be barriers to the general public. So the thing as an OT, and what research suggests since this whole presentation is based off of research is to keep it simple and keep the sequence, let it make sense. So let's think of a microwave. 
So some microwaves are very simple and they only have numbers on it and a start button and maybe a few pictures if you wanna warm up like a pizza or popcorn. So that makes sense to most people. I type in how long and then I push start. Well, then you can also get microwaves that also function as ovens. And now you have some dials on it to change the temperature. And then you have time adjustments and you have numbers on it, but maybe you need to set a different setting on it. Well, now that doesn't make as much sense. And so it's not as usable to the general public. So we always suggest bringing in individuals with disabilities or even talking to people within your department or where you're at on how can we make that more simple? Because when you make it more simple, more people can use it and they can use it faster or they can use it more easily. And so more people will be willing to either go to that place or use that product, just depending upon what we're talking about. Also going into a few more details and other ideas to re remediate cognitive barriers, is have individuals choose their schedule. When those individuals can choose their schedule, they're able to go through about their day easier because they know what to expect and it's in their typical routine versus being in my routine, which is not somebody else's routine. Not everybody wants to shower in the morning and I can't blame them for that. Others like to shower at night. So if it's in their routine, they're going to be able to process through that day a little bit easier than what may be your typical routine. Having the individual again choose whether you show op options with pictures versus words, pictures are often a lot easier for anybody to look at and be like, oh, I need to do this versus reading words and then having to process those words. And then also having individuals participate in daily activities, whether it's cooking, cleaning, shopping, leisure, anything. When you have them participating in more of those daily activities, they gain more skills and more knowledge and they're able to implement that in future tasks that they do without having to have as much help because you've allowed them to gather more knowledge by doing these daily things. We also suggest not to use abbreviations because even I don't know every single abbreviation. So how do you expect somebody else in the general public again to know the abbreviations that you are using? So you see, I use an abbreviation because GPS is fairly well known. It's your geographical portal system, I believe. I could be wrong on that, so feel free to correct me. But you can use those for navigation. You can set somebody up with those and they can walk following the route rather than you know, saying, go left on this street and right on this street or north and south. Don't give me north and south directions, not a good idea. But the nice thing about GPS devices is they also change the route based on where you go. So if you get distracted and you plow past that street when you're walking by or driving, well, it's gonna correct and it's gonna tell you where you can turn next to resume your route and keep going the rest of the way. So now we're meeting barriers and room setup. So what I would suggest is just keep the area very open and also tell people when you're in stores, like, hey, you know, there's a lot of things in that aisle. I'm not gonna be able to make it down it easily and other people are going to have the same issues. So having three foot wide pathways or a five foot circumference area for wheelchair turns. Well, just making sure those floors are clear. And when you advocate for those kind of things, they begin to realize that it's important. And you can even relate it to, if your floors aren't clear, people who can't access those aisles are gonna go somewhere else or they're going to try and access those aisles. And if they're, let's say using a walker, they may fall down because there's so many things to pick up their walker over. Also, we suggest no rugs or at least no rugs with flare ups. Again, those catch on everything, whether it's my foot when I'm walking or you, when you're using a walker, you have to make sure you pick it up over so you don't go tumbling forward on your walker. Um, and just making there, sure there's large spaces around everything that's supposed to be accessed for everybody. Now, when we look at vision barriers, so vision barriers, when most people think about it, they just think about reading, but vision barriers also can include like depth perception and seeing where a sidewalk curb is. So to start with those reading ones, um, you, if you're at a place or, or are a store, you'd always have magnifying glasses or screen readers available for anybody to use. So you're not just 
putting it for individuals with disabilities. You're just saying anybody can use it. You don't have to categorize yourself as something, which is what we're huge on. You want to make things accessible for everybody, but you don't want to point fingers at the people who are using those more accessible items. Providing text-to-speech options. I love when I go into museums or places like that and where they have large prints of text, they have a thing that reads it for you or they have headphones available so you can just walk around and press a number and it starts talking about that particular display. Having large print is great. 16 point or larger is preferred and simple font is the best. So like Arial or Calibri are great fonts to use to make it accessible to everyone and not to not be hard to read. Like I said, audio options. And then uh, when we're thinking about depth perception, contrasting colors are great. So then people can see where one thing ends and another thing begins. So that gives you the example of like having painted curbs so people know when they're gonna step off or having colored edges on the steps. So then they know there's something there or something is coming. Now to talk about sensory barriers. So sensory is huge for individuals with disabilities, but even for people in the general public, there are so many of us who don't have a specific disability, but there are things sensory wise that we don't like or we don't prefer. And so when you address these for individuals with disabilities, you're really addressing it for the general public and you're just making it better for everybody. So I'm gonna talk about sound first. So when we have sound coming in, it can become so overwhelming for individuals any individual when you have a lot of noise. So you can provide noise dimming headphones and you can provide them to anybody. Doesn't have to have a disability. Again, making it accessible for all and not pointing out to places. You can have escape areas or quiet areas, which are off to one spot, but that again, anybody can use to help calm down before they go back out into the environment that they were in. Decreasing volume level can always help Having sound absorbing panels is also a huge help because it has been found in certain individuals like autism, individuals who have autism, uh, they can actually hear some of the reverberations off of the walls. And so that adds even more input to them and makes it even more difficult to continue what task they're doing because now they have even more input coming in and they're trying to focus on what you're saying or what they're doing, but when you have so much coming in, it can make it very difficult. And you also can alter sounds to be less alerting and more pleasant to the ear. Then looking at visual and touch or feeling sensories. So if you look at the picture I have at the bottom, it shows that it doesn't have a lot going on. The extra visualized stimuli is removed there's fewer items on the wall. And this just decreases the visual stimulation. You can also see there's soft lighting in there. They have calm colors. These can all help with visual, visual stimuli and just decreasing that so it's not as overwhelming for someone coming into the area. You can also change sensory features of the furniture or objects in the room, making something smooth, something's rough. You could have like one couch that's leather, another couch that has like the typical felt, and then another couch that maybe has a blanket over it. So it's just a whole nother texture. You could also provide deep pressure options such as weighted vests or blankets or spio vests. And so these can help some people really calm down and calm down quicker. Like if you're in a doctor's office or in a dentist because not everybody loves those places. A spio vest is a little bit different. It's sort of like a compression garment that sort of that velcros on. Um, they do help, but it's just a different option out there if you would want to use it. Then I put unpredictability under sensory because it doesn't fall really greatly in any other area. But when we're looking at an unpredictability, that can be schedules or what you're doing in your day. So I suggest posting schedules, posting changes, making announcements of this is going to change. Also with unpredictability, it becomes with that sound and light. So you can coordinate those to make them 
similar. So if you have a environment that you're trying to simulate like a thunderstorm, having lightning strike and then thunder go versus thunder going randomly and lightning striking randomly, when you have those paired, it will be easier for individuals to understand and know what's going on rather than being not necessarily confused, but overwhelmed because things aren't pairing up how they typically would in the world. Making tasks straightforward, whether it's at a museum or an amusement park or like the Discovery Center and here, making those tasks go straight through things and not being like you jump here and then there and then there can make it easier for individuals with disabilities to understand what they're doing or even just the daily anybody in the world. Also, I would suggest making a sensory guide explaining the sensory stimulation that individuals will experience as they go throughout that place that they're going to or having a visual schedule or social story on how they can go through your place. So then they can schedule that even with their kids or the individual with the disability can decide how they're gonna go through that day so they know what to expect. And it's not as difficult then because they already know what's going to happen. And you can have that posted for anybody out there. So then we can talk about societal attitudes. And as you saw, this was a huge thing that affected so many people with disabilities as well as the society recognized that. And so the biggest thing all research articles stated was to educate, but how do you educate? So you can gain experience and that experience can be broad. You can train staff how to interact or provide for anybody. You can participate in disability simulations. Like you could get out the ADA checklist and go through that with somebody and really understand what people with disabilities, especially physical disabilities, are experiencing when they come into your place. You can partner with individuals with disabilities and take their advice on what to change in your store or what greatly affects them in your store since they've been there a few times. You can hold gatherings for a lot of people and make sure it's known that it's for anybody and advertise to individuals with disabilities to make them feel more welcome. You can always post information or make informational handouts available for what supports are available at your store. So if somebody with a disability comes in either then or looks prior to see what your store offers, then they know what you're going to give them. Not that they shouldn't have everything accessible to them, but if they know they can go to the front of the store and ask for assistance and that's where you'd prefer them to go, then they know, and then the general public knows as well what is expected at your store. When we're looking at policy and implementation, this can be on so many different levels, whether it's an organization or a store or at the state and federal level, reviewing policies with people within and also outside of your agency can help you realize what policies may not be as accessible for some people. You can always employ individuals with disabilities and then really care about helping them and knowing what they need to do the job successfully. You can also ask what is needed or what would help someone complete their job even better than they are. So you're not asking them to say that they have a disability or need an accommodation. You're just being the employer who's doing it a step ahead and going, hey, you're doing your job great. Is there anything I can do to make it easier for you? And maybe they just need a different keyboard and I would help them a ton because it's what they use at home. Like I said, always educate, testify and contact your leaders. They don't know what they don't know. And so if you don't bring it as an issue to them, they may not know it is an issue. And I'd always encourage ongoing communication. Now to talk about transportation barriers. Since this was the largest thing that affected the most amount of people for um, individuals with disabilities, I thought it'd be a good thing to address all types of transportation because transportation includes walking, driving, and public transportation. So when you're thinking about walking, having those smooth sidewalks and 
areas to get up onto sidewalks is very, very important. Also, if you think about crosswalks, so when I go across a crosswalk, I have to walk a decent speed to get it across it in time, at least here in Pierre, there's one that's very, or two that are very short amount of time to get through. And so increasing those crosswalk times makes it even more accessible for all individuals. So they don't have to run across that street to get across. Also with crosswalks, having signs that make sounds for individuals who are blind or visually impaired. So then they know that when that dinging starts to increase or get faster, that they only have a little bit more time to get across the street. And then you can also think about having rest areas on sidewalks throughout town rather than just in parks. Because when you're trying to walk to the store, you may need to take a break. And if there's no place to sit down, maybe sitting down on the ground is too hard. Also looking at lighting. So lighting the streets. I've done a lot of walking here in Pierre at night. And I know in other cities where I've lived in the past, where once it gets dark, you can't really see. So when it gets dark at four o'clock, you know, I still need to go to the store and go do this. Well, if there's not lights to light my path, I may trip or hurt myself while walking and not see something. Then when we go into driving, having visible street signs is always helpful. It doesn't matter who you are, but it makes it easier to know what the rules of the road are at that point. Having simple in intersections, having like a slow moving ordinance. So then maybe you have a community area that has a lot of older individuals or individuals with disabilities who prefer to drive slow. And having that ordinance will help as long as well as you could have a golf cart ordinance in that area because golf carts usually aren't super fast either. Also, um, one way streets can be very, very fun. Not really. Um, so one-way streets, I've been down in the Des Moines, Iowa area, and they have a ton of one-way streets down there. And I get so confused as to where I can go and what I can do. And so sometimes I'm just praying I don't go down the one street the wrong way because I didn't see the sign. So when we have two-way streets where you can go both directions, that's a lot easier for any individual out there to know that they can go down both routes and they're not gonna get in trouble. They're not gonna go into oncoming traffic. So that is one article talked a lot about decreasing one-way streets and make it, that makes it easier cognitively. Then for public transportation, education programs for the public is great to know how to use your transportation, knowing how to do any part of it would always be good and to have like practice run throughs with people so they know what to expect. Offering door to door or door through door services can also help a lot, but also being that person who asks for those and when it's asked for enough, it will be offered because they have enough people who need that service to be provided. Then you can, if it's like a busing system or a railroad, having stop announcements um, and route identification, whether it's visual or auditory, having multiple ways to get that input is good because sometimes auditory doesn't always work great if the bus is loud or a lot of people are talking around you so you need to be able to see it and some people are hearing impaired so they need to be able to see it and then on the vice versa some people are visually impaired so they need to be able to hear when they need to get off the bus and then another thing i thought was cool a lot of articles talked about having senior or access fans. So these senior access fans are a little lower to ground. They have the ramp to get in to the vehicle rather than having to go up onto a lift. And they're just easier overall to navigate for individuals with disabilities or older adults. So when we look at physical barriers, a lot of you have seen a lot of these, so I'm going to point out a few since physical barriers are known a lot more by the public. So one that I want to point out is lever door handles. So a lot of people have probably come across these and they don't always think of 
how much easier it is to maybe open. A lot of people have started using their elbows to open these, especially during COVID. But if you think of somebody who has an amputation or doesn't have great function in their hand, it makes it a lot more difficult to open the turnstile um, door handles rather than having the lever just to push down on. You don't need a lot of force to push down and then you don't have to pull hard or push depending on which day, way the door opens. And so it makes it a lot easier. Like one disability or not really a disability, but a lot of people have is arthritis. And when your arthritis is flaring up or is really bad, it can be, it can hurt to grab on to a door handle. So with these levers, levers, you just have to push down a little bit and then you are good to go. Also looking at making sure you remove cords from being around on the ground or putting um, not necessarily a carpet, but an actual cord cover over it to make sure it's safe, people can't trip on it. And then it's easier for individuals, let's say in wheelchairs or walkers to go over. So how do you check if your space is available or accessible, sorry. You wanna review the Americans with Disability Act guidelines. You could discuss with your employees what would help them do their job even better. Or you could perform a walkthrough of your location with an individual with disabilities and ask them, what would you change? What would you suggest? And actually take those uh, things that they give you into consideration and what is feasible for you to be able to do. You can also check out your space through the checklist. I would highly suggest it. And I'd even highly suggest it if you don't own a place to take it to places and go, hey, check this out. See if your store is actually accessible for all individuals. And the nice thing about this checklist, it gives other ideas. It gives you what the standard is, but it gives you ideas on how to fix those, whether it's more expensively or cheaper. So advocacy, obviously what my whole capstone is about, it really is an effective strategy to encourage adaptations of innov innovations, to get things moving forward. Because if a store owner doesn't know you don't like coming to their store because they can't reach things, well, they're, they could be like, oh, I could always have somebody assist you with that. But you could say, oh, well, I've been in your store and they don't seem willing to assist. And so they can have those conversations with their employees to say, you need to offer help to everybody, not just individuals with disabilities, but everybody should have your help or assistance as needed. But like I gave the example with the legislators, when I was providing them information, they were like, oh my, I hadn't thought of it that way. And so they had bills in mind that they're like, I need to think about this just a little bit differently to make sure I'm voting in an appropriate manner and how that's going to affect other people out there. And simplicity is key. So when you're going to talk to people or you're providing um, services, keeping it simple and to the point is the way to go. So there's a lot of references.